The world is currently facing a major water crisis. There are more than 884 million people around the planet that lack access to clean water. As a result, more than 1.8 million people die each year due to waterborne illnesses. With our senior design project, we have looked to tackle this issue. We present to you Hydrovita, a high-speed water sterilization system for developing countries. My name is Juan Jacobus, and these are my teammates, Rubik Lodia, Talbar Orr, Ishan Segel, and Garb Gupta. Our advisor on this project was Professor Andrew Jackson from the Mechanical Engineering Department. Professor Jackson also works with an organization in a village in Kenya that has more than 5,000 people that lack access to electricity and clean water. So what we have right here is the final prototype that we have developed over the course of the past two semesters. Let me tell you a little bit about its key features. Hydrovita is the first full-scale prototype that incorporates a novel silver nanowire and carbon nanotube technology that was developed at Stanford University and published in a paper in August of 2010. This was just one month before we began our project. The system is capable of inactivating bacteria at a very high flow rate of 16 liters per hour. This means that we could potentially provide water for up to 25 people per day and much more if the system were to be scaled up. It requires minimal amount of power to use, only 160 milliwatts. To give you a better perspective of what this means, Hydrovita could potentially be run using only three 9 volt batteries for up to 20 hours under continuous operation. However, for the purposes of our prototype, we have chosen to build a solar module, module that provides power to the system. It's a very versatile design, which means that it can be easily incorporated into most of the existing infrastructure currently available in developing countries. Furthermore, it is easy to use and maintain, as anybody with limited technical skills is able to take it apart and perform routine cleaning and maintenance. Finally, we expect that the total manufacturing cost of Hydrovita, if it were to be produced on a large commercial scale, would be under $100. Now, this is rather remarkable considering the fact that most other similar products currently being implemented in the market are way more expensive than Hydrovita. Furthermore, the flow rate that Hydrovita has is a lot higher than most of, the, of these other competing systems. So basically, the two main differentiating factors of our system are its very low cost and its extremely high flow rate. So now that I've introduced to you our project and talked about some of the key features, my teammate Gaurav is going to talk about the technical aspects and explain to you how Hydrovita actually works. Thank you, Juan. So as you can see right here, Hydrovita, our system has four major subcomponents. The first of these is the input chamber. So as Juan mentioned before, we wanted Hydrovita to be something that can fit in with existing infrastructure. We didn't want it to replace infrastructure, we wanted to, it to fit in. So as you can see, our input chamber has a standard NPT valve connector. You could connect it to any so sort of input source. You could connect it to a piping system, you could connect it to a tank. So you can take advantage of all the existing infrastructure in the developing world. The second part of our system is the turbidity filter. This filter is responsible for removing large organic particles from the water. It can remove things like mud, things like small pebbles, even some protozoa. It has two steel meshes inside it, a 60 micron mesh and a 95 micron mesh. And as you can see, it's very easy to remove. So every time it gets clogged up, you can take it out, wash it up and put it right back in. You don't need any technical expertise to be able to do this. So as Juan said, it's very easy to use and maintain. This brings me to the third part of our system. This is really the heart of our system. This is the nano filter cartridge, the top half of this assembly here. Uh, this uses a brand new technology that was developed at Stanford. It, our present implementation contains seven silver nanowire carbon nanotube filters. As I said earlier and as Juan mentioned, this technology was developed at Stanford very, very recently. It was published in a paper only in August 2010. So how it works is as follows. You take a sheet of cotton, a standard sheet of cotton, something you could buy off Walmart. Coat it with carbon nanotube solution, dry it out. Then coat it with silver nanowire solution, dry it out again. And then roll it up into what becomes a cylindrical filter. Then you connect this filter to a power source. The black wire here acts as a counter electrode and the red wire acts as an electrode. As soon as you run water through the filter, it completes the circuit and you can see electricity flowing through it. If this water was to have bacteria in it, as the bacteria goes through the filter, there are three main processes that happen within the filter. The first of these is electroporation. So what happens is, due to the potential difference, there's a very high electric field generated within the nano, nanowire loops. Even though the potential difference is very small, it's only 24 volts, when you go down to the nanoscale, it really gets magnified. So you can think of bacteria going through these little nano loops through 
as soon as it goes through because of the electric field it gets pulled apart its cell wall breaks down and it gets completely inactivated also since we're using silver silver has its own antimicrobial properties so it also helps us to kill some bacteria finally because we're running electricity through the water it leads to pH changes and generation of some chemicals such as chlorine which also help us to sterilize the water Finally, the inactivated bacteria simply flows through the filter and goes down into the output chamber. This, here we are very different from other filters. Most other filters use porous surfaces to trap bacteria. So what happens is over time, as you, re, as you keep using the filter, the bacteria keeps accumulating and the filter keeps slowing down. With our design, you can consistently achieve high flow rates. This is really a big advantage. So here's an exploded view of the nanofilter cartridge. It explains how we implemented this within our system. Here you can see the counter electrode, the electrode wrapped around the seven silver nanowire carbon nanotube filters, and here's where we connect the system to power. Finally, this brings me to the fourth and final subcomponent of our system. This is the output chamber, which just like the input chamber is very adaptable. Right now we have a little tap here, but you could connect it to any standard NPT connector and you could connect it to a hose, you could output into a tank. It's very, very, very versatile. So now you know that our system does require power to run. However, this electricity is not, I'm sorry, this electricity is not always available in the developing world. There's lack of access of electricity. So we also decided to create an accessory, a solar module, that can help people power the system when they don't have access to electricity. And now I'm going to pass it on to Ritwik, who's going to tell you a little bit about our solar module. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, this uh, filter can be powered by a variety of sources. However, since uh, there's a lack of availability of power, we have this module over here. Uh, the main reason um, the power consumption in this uh, filter technology would be very low is because the only process that requires electricity or any kind any sort, uh, sort of power is the electroporation process. It requires about 20 volts and about an average of 7 milliamps to work. What you see before you here is a 24 volt, 20 watt solar panel uh, that is uh, trickle charging to uh, a pair of uh, 12 volt, uh, 7.2 amp hour uh, lead acid batteries. These batteries by themselves can power the system for about 42 days on continuous operation. The uh, solar panel only requires about nine hours to charge these batteries, and it is also uh, equipped with uh, some indicators, a voltmeter, a battery level indicator, and charging indicator to show, to, to show users how effectively and how um, uh, consistently it is operating. This system can also easily rotate and tilt to maximize the utility of the solar panel. This is a very sustainable solution to uh, the power requirements of this uh, project in uh, developing countries because it is completely independent of the grid and uh, this kind of system can potentially power multiple uh, uh, filter stages. I will now hand it off to Tal who will discuss uh, our testing and results. Thank you, Ritwick. So as you have seen, our project incorporates a wide variety of disciplines, from material science, to chemistry, to biology, to electrical engineering, and to mechanical engineering, of course. So the main and most crucial component of our whole system is our silver nanowire carbon nanotube filter. And this was the riskiest part. What we started out with was we really didn't understand like how much uh, silver nanowire solution to put on, how, how much you soak the cotton in. So this was where we devoted our first semester to. We devoted it to really make it uh, viable and happen and inactivate bacteria. So we started out with doing a small scale test, a small scale test that is pretty much exactly what was done in the Stanford lab to make sure that we could really inactivate bacteria with this. And this was uh, done with water that has E. coli in it, a very high concentration of E. coli that's actually a safe strand, so we wouldn't get sick. <laughs> and with that, what we did is we uh, passed it through and achieved 97% inactivation. So this uh, was a very promising result and, and mirrored the, the results that were found before. So with that, we pushed it to the full scale, which is what you have here today in front of you. With that, we were able to achieve 81% in activation. This is really a tremendous result because we scaled it up over 100 times in surface area from what we had in the small scale. And it's really the very first time that a filter like this was scaled up. And we have identified different opportunities to really push this to 99.9%, .9%, which is what's needed for safe drinking water. 
Now, Ishan is going to discuss the different ways in which we can optimize the system and further improve it. Thanks, Tal. So as Tal mentioned earlier, in our small, set, in our small test setup, we, we were able to achieve efficiencies of over 97%, and therefore we realized that this project has a major scope for improvement in the actual final prototype. So the first and most obvious thing that we decided to do is to increase the filtration fastness or have the water pass through multiple passes of these filters. Basically what happens is by increasing the filtration fastness, you're increasing the surface area, therefore increasing the probability of bacteria to get inactivated in the process. Another major issue that we faced was actually while producing these, uh, these filters. These filters were all produced manually by hand by using a pipette and therefore we weren't able to ensure the same amount of uh, solutions that were applied at each given point of the filter. Therefore, by having a standardized manufacturing procedure, we would ensure the same electrical properties across the whole, in, entire filter and therefore we would be able to achieve higher efficiencies. The current orientation of the filter, as Gaurav mentioned earlier, is a cylindrical filter which the water passes through from above and what we thought was they could be like worm tunnel-like holes where actually the water with the bacteria passes through without actually getting inactivated and therefore we'd like to change the orientation, maybe stack it up, maybe have multiple pellets of cotton balls and therefore try various orientations in order to get higher efficiency. As we spoke about it earlier, we tested this system on E. coli which is basically representative of all other bacteria. And it's the majority of the waterborne illnesses that are faced in developing countries come from bacteria. Though we also are aware of the fact that certain viruses and protozoa do cause other waterborne illnesses, so we'd like to conduct extensive biological tests in order to prove the overall efficiency. Once we actually achieve the 99.9% .9 inactivation rate of all microorganisms in this system, we'd actually like to look into the entrepreneurial possibilities. Though our entire project is only showcased for the fact that this system can be used in developing countries for uh, drinking purposes, this system can actually be implemented in various industrial processes that require sterile and clean water, therefore leaving us with endless possibilities. I'd like to conclude at that. We'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Jackson for being our advisor, Professor Robert Jasper for giving us all his valuable time and insight, and Dr. Ken Lager, the ESC Senior Design Professor. And of course, the Penny of Water, which provided us an additional grant since 2010-2011, is the Penny of Water, and they're the ones who helped us get along this far. We'd also like to thank all these people for helping us along the way. Thanks for being a great audience. We'd like to leave the floor open for questions.